Hello and welcome to another episode of Schlock Tactics, the movie podcast where we believe badder is better and aim to review the campy cruise ship horrors so that you don't have to. My name's Ash and I'm joined once again by Mark. Oh hi Mark. Good evening. And welcome everyone to our Halloween special for this year. Now some would say that 2020 has been terrifying enough in itself. <laughs> But uh, we always need um, shitty horror movies to, to cheer us up, so we're here again for our Halloween special. We've only done one of these before, which was, I think, two years ago, when we did two of the actual Halloween films. Yeah. Uh, Halloween Curse of Michael Myers and uh, Halloween Resurrection, which were, were good fun. So you can go back and check that out for a, another Halloween special. And the last episode that we did was our um, sort of toy-themed tie-in, which was Garbage Pale Kids and Masters of the Universe two uh, terrible films that were based off of toys that got their own TV shows and eventually uh, movies, so go back and check that one out as well. But here we are today to talk to you about two horror films, sort of, loosely uh, horror films, uh, monster movies, Um, both with a very similar theme, things happening at sea on uh, cruise ships, that is Deep Rising from 1998 and Ghost Ship from 2002. Had you seen either of these before, Mark? No. no. Um, I remember being at school and seeing a trailer, or, or definitely the poster anyway, of for Ghost Ship. And yeah. thinking, well, that looks really cheesy, having a skull on the front of a ship. And <laughs> um, I'm not really sure if I heard of Deep Rising. I think Ghost Ship is notorious for its sort of um, playground hype. And chatter like, have you seen? Yeah. Have you seen this film? Have you seen the the, the opening scene and stuff? But mm. I'd actually never seen Ghost Ship until uh, until tonight, and despite multiple people telling me that I I should initially as someone that liked horror and then as someone that, that was doing a bad movie podcast. I don't know um, why you would watch it if you like horror. <laughs> no, no, fair. But um, but Deep Rising has been a favourite of mine for yeah the last uh, last twenty years or so. So we will get into both of those uh we'll get straight into it with uh deep rising from 1998 Uh, now both of these films have uh great taglines i don't know if you saw either of the taglines on these posters um no (laughs) (laughs) i was trying to picture the ghost ship poster could you like set to it's not like set to fail or something no no not quite um deep rising is full scream ahead all right which is quite good uh, Ghost Ship is Sea Evil, spelled S E A. Oh yeah, no, not that, not very good. No, but uh, yeah, Deep Rising was, like I say, released in 1998. Actually, came out exactly one month after Titanic, and uh, I'm sure you noticed ah. quite a few similarities between these films and yeah. Titanic being quite a popular film in yeah. the late 90s as well. I think they were both um, had that in mind, but this one came out one month later, so I don't think you can accuse them of of ripping it off too much um harrison ford was initially attached to play the uh the lead character finnegan uh, but then dropped out after which the uh, budget of the film also dropped out <laughs> <laughs> and they got uh poor old treat williams in to be uh, to be the hero and play finnegan uh, instead it was directed by stephen summers who um i think we've we've inadvertently mentioned on the show before uh, after this film he would direct the mummy with, ah. with Brendan Fraser, which is good, and then The Mummy Returns, which was not so good, and then obviously that famous CGI sequence at the end of The Mummy Returns with, with the rock that we've, oh, yeah. that we've spoken about before. So he's no stranger to crummy kind of CGI uh, monster movies, and he would also do Van Helsing eventually, which is quite a, a famous bad movie that um, perhaps we'll review one day. <laughs> but in this movie... I think everyone can agree that the that the special effects are awesome. They're headed up by Rob Bottin, who famously did all the special effects for The Thing, John Carpenter's The, the Thing, RoboCop, Total Recall, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Ah. So practical and CGI, that's the guy I think he went involved. I was quite surprised that he did something like this, which was not a sort of huge budget, but um, it's a good job he did because the effects were one of the highlights, I think, of this this film. Um, the film opens up with a kind of a, a prologue about um, how deep the ocean is and how deep it is in certain parts and the Mariana Trench, you know, there are places people have never been until James Cameron went down there um, a, a while ago. So you're definitely in the same territory as Titanic. And the music is kind of like Godzilla or Jaws-esque. Yeah. This is the same year that Godzilla, Roland Emmerich's Godzilla came out. And I think I think if you take sort of Jaws... Titanic and maybe a bit of Godzilla and mash it together. That's 
kind of what Deep Rising is. I did think about Godzilla. I was thinking sort of in the vein of like those kind of 90s uh, big Hollywood fails of like monstrous kind of films um, yeah. that just were poor, like the like the uh, Hollywood Godzilla of the 90s. Monstrous things that came out of the sea yeah. and attacked things. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a subgenre in itself. As I say, this does star Treat Williams as your hero, Finnegan. And he is uh, sort of the head of a like a, a, a crew for hire. Uh, and uh, we open up with them sort of cutting through some choppy water. He's also joined by his sort of um, comic relief sidekick, Joey, who actually is generally quite, quite funny throughout yeah. this film. Um, but they're also joined by this sort of crew of pirates or mercenaries, I guess you could say. Um, now, there's quite a few interesting faces here. I don't know if you noticed, Mark, we had two people returning to the show here, both in this one scene, and both we featured both in the same episode I was trying to, before. I was trying to look out for people, because I knew this would happen, but <laughs> I didn't recognise anyone from previous episodes. So, in this little group of pirates, we had both the actor that played Sagat in Street Fighter, the movie, and the actor that played Kano in Mortal Kombat. Oh wow! So, oh yeah, of both course. films we reviewed in our Game Over Two um, yeah, episode. Obviously, that's Kano. Yeah. yeah. Now that guy, he's called Trevor Goddard. Actually, he pops up in lots of things because he's got quite a distinctive geezer accent. And uh, Wes Studi plays Sagat. He's um, quite a well-known Nat- Native American actor. He was in Last of the Mohicans and stuff like that. So, here we have a, a Schlock Tactics reunion. Of two people that were reviewed in the same episode like before. So that's yeah. that's quite interesting. Sagat and Kano. Um, you've got other people in this little group, like um, the guy that played uh, Amistad, the African guy. He's been in a lot of films. guy from um, Lock, Stock and yeah, Two Yeah, Fleming. Barrels. Yeah. Um, I can't remember his first name, but he's got Fleming with a Y in it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Alex Fleming, I think maybe. Alexander Fleming. Yeah, um, yeah him. There's there's a few a few of familiar faces. So yeah, there's I think... Quite a, f- a few faces here that will go on to be sort of bigger, mm. a little bit bigger, and then a few people that have been in um, video game movies before yeah. that we've talked about. So an interesting group. And at the same time, you have your sort of female lead of the film, uh, Famke Janssen, um, who is seen on the cruise ship itself. She's hot, hot off the heels of um, Goldeneye in 1995 here. She's got oh like God. a sex based neck. Yeah. <laughs> she like pretends to have sex with you and then snaps your neck yeah. with her muscular thighs. Her? Yeah, it's her. Wow. Yeah. Um, Xenia. On Xenia a, on, on a top. top. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to think back to the game. <laughs> yeah, if I'm Kajansen, uh, she's just coming off of Xenia on a top in Goldeneye. Oh, cool. And she would go on to be in uh, X Men, the X Men movie, shortly after this. So she's on the rise. She plays uh, quite a great titled character called Trillian St. James who is kind of a professional thief. There's this whole uh, opening scene on the cruise ship itself with, uh, obviously, it's very extravagant. There's casinos, loads of rich, like, white people gambling and rich, like, Asian uh, oligarchs uh, enjoying the casino. Um, There's some, like, Japanese drums playing as well. This this guy, Simon Canton, um, who plays the sort of, I guess, the, the technically the villain in the film. He's the kind of... The rich asshole that owns the ship, hmm. um, and he gives a speech about I don't know how it's great to be a rich asshole. I think <laughs> something like that. But while this is going on, uh, Famke Jansen is uh, snooping around. Trillian is snooping around, and then um, you start to get these sub subterranean sort of whale noises. Yeah. He's like, Ooh, <laughs> "What's that?" So yeah, whilst on back on the, on the uh, on the mercenary ship, uh, Joey, the sidekick, discovers that there's these sort of cruise missiles being stashed in the boat, which is something that they didn't they didn't sign up for. And it's uh, Finnegan's sort of motto is that uh, if you've got the cash, we don't ask. Or oh something, yeah, something if the like cash that. is there, we don't care. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which Joey points out is a terrible sort of ph- then, yeah, philosophy. They've, they've got torpedoes, haven't they? Yeah, some sort of torpedoes, missiles, and they've all got like guns and they're dressed in like black military gear. So the the sort of private uh, army element is is pretty obvious, I yeah. think. But then it seems like Trillian is is doing some sort of um, corporate espionage or thieving, and she's caught. Um, by the captain and and Simon Canton and thrown in the brig. There's sort of a montage of the pirates gearing up, and this is one of those moments yeah. where the the um, 
marines or the pirates in this case uh, the colonial marines are sort of gearing up with their like they've got these like assault rifles that are like very small mini guns at the same time there's a sort of montage of, a, of someone on the ship that's sabotaging all the, the communication and the navigation equipment and it's at that point that something something attacks the ship and just everything starts rocking to and fro this is like this is a great scene this is like pure chaos people flying over roulette tables yeah cl- classical instruments flying everywhere people falling off like balconies and yeah stuff. plummeting um sort of to, to their doom <laughs> um fantastic scene where a woman's um trying to go to the toilet and um, oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> all you see is her getting sucked into it and then loads of blood flying out which yeah, is that was pretty cool which is amazing all set to sort of whale noise so you don't know what the creature is it's just so obviously by the time the pirates board the ship it's completely abandoned like a ghost ship they've obviously were expecting to be uh, to be met by someone or to uh, to have some resistance and there isn't so there's this this whole sequence of them wandering about trying to figure out where where the rest of the uh, the passengers are where the crew are there's nobody there everything is obviously in disarray and tables turned over and broken things everywhere Kano, Trevor Goddard, wanders off and gets himself killed at this point. You still don't see anything, though. They, I think they do a good job of holding off here. Yeah. You don't really see what's going on. It's just slithering noises and whale noises and squelching noises. It's quite it's quite good. You don't really see anything <clears throat> until about halfway through the film. No, like, and the monster good. isn't on the cover either. In the course of exploring the ship, the uh, the pirates find Trillian in the brig is where she was, where we last saw her. There's a really funny bit where they, they manage to open the safe and as soon as they open the door, uh, Canton, the owner of the ship, just comes out of it screaming with a fire axe and like sinks it into this guy's head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this kind of confused me because even though this is... I feel like this is quite an adult film and there's lots of gore and violence, but when this happens, all of the people in the scene have the most polite and uh, reactions to it. Oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> Bloody hell! Oh, for God's sake, what did you do that for? Like, nobody swears in this film, no. which is a bit weird, because there's some quite gore, gory bits in this And film. there are a couple of actors in it who have English accents, so it sounds even yeah. funnier, because they've got like... Oh, Jesus Christ! Yeah. <laughs> you put an axe in his head! Oh, for goodness sake! Um, so that, that's only made it, it more funny. Um, lots of shouting, lots of to and fro but they end up sort of putting aside their differences, apart from the guy with the axe in his head. And uh, the pirates and the crew sort of form this this um, this sort of unit. Head downstairs in the ship to, again, see if they can find the, the passengers. Along the way, it's revealed here what is probably obvious to most people, that Canton, the owner of the ship, was the inside man. He was collaborating with the pirates. He's the one that sabotaged the navigation equipment, but... Um, he never intended for anyone to die. It was the plan for the passengers to be evacuated. He's not a monster. Yeah. Um, it was not, he did not plan on a gigantic sea monster to uh, to arrive. This is a great scene. This is the first time you see the creature, uh, or parts of the creature. As they're arguing, you get the one of those sort of wide shots where there's there's some you're looking at someone face on, but it's gone super wide, so you know to look at the background. Yeah. And there's just someone going like, hmm. Something behind me. Is there something behind me? I feel like there's something behind me, you know, just doing that face. And uh, you see this sort of thorny, slimy, dripping tentacle sort of slithering yeah. past, which is great. And it spews out um, one of the crew members that was eaten earlier um, on, on the, the smaller ship. Um, and this is what's known famously as the half digested Billy scene. <laughs> um, that's what the character's called. And this is your first look at the effects in this film. And I think this scene is fucking awesome. There's a guy that gets spewed out, and you're like, oh, God, like, he doesn't look too well. And then he stands up, oh, he's just a bit slimy. He looks like he might be okay. <laughs> and then he turns his head slightly to the side, and you can see all of his skull. <laughs> and then he holds up his hand, and it's like the flesh is dripping off the bones, and it's it's fucking brilliant. Yeah, I liked the um, the body effects, like seeing the yeah. bones and flesh and stuff. But I wasn't sure about the CGI of the monster itself, but it was probably good at the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, I'm sure you weren't expecting even stuff this good in this film, were you? Yeah, I exactly. Mean, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. It's better than it's better <laughs> effects than this film deserves. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> I, I know many films of its time would get, but yeah, it's still a bit superimposed and like doesn't quite fit with the 
the surroundings. But you'd expect that for a bad film. Well, nineteen ninety eight. Yeah, like that's that's very early days, and we've seen a lot worse. Yeah, a lot later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's sort of a bit of a rinse and repeat around this sort of time. Is various people wandering off from the the main group and getting attacked by the kind of toothy, spiky worm tentacles. Um, lots, of deaths, lots of gunning. Yeah, lo- lots of aliens, <laughs> yeah. uh, colonial marines type type action. Um, Canton has this sort of um, this basil exposition where for some reason he knows about these things and he says, "Oh well, of course, there's things that live at the bottom of the ocean that are." Um, you know, we don't know anything about. We don't know what's down there, man. You know, mm. and these talks about these creatures. I don't know if they're meant to be worms or something. Um, this is still the part of the film where you're meant to think that these are worms, individual, small, smaller sort of creatures. Yeah. And he says they don't eat you; they drink you. It's quite an interesting concept. I, I'm always quite fascinated with um, you know documentaries about what's down at, in the deepest parts of the sea. And when you see pictures of that, you see the weird shit like gulper eels and goblin sharks and there is some weird shit down there so it wouldn't surprise you if there was some sort of tentacle tentacle thorny kraken creature yeah. you know? i was hoping to see a megalodon but <laughs> no dice <laughs> you're looking for a different film yeah i can i can direct you um there's a scene here which is i think in most action films where where there's a part that's flooded and people have to dive under and swim to the other side and then when i'm on the other side i'll uh, fire a shot so you know i've made it through like this is very generic i thought i thought the film was better than this reminds me of the scene yeah. in um i didn't really make many notes in this part because it's just like <laughs> quite repetitive it's just generic aliens yeah. um or predator sort of stuff hmm. this reminded me mostly of um scene from Alien Resurrection, which had come out the previous year, where um, people have to swim under a flooded bit, and then the, the, the xenomorph can also swim, and it chases after them, and they have to shoot it. It's almost mm. like a clone of that. I don't know whether that was deliberate or not. I think the, the middle of this film is sort of flabby Aliens rip-off, where it's a little bit, it's a little bit boring, and a little bit like everything you've ever seen that involves a monster and some just, soldiers. Just yeah. nowhere near as good as Aliens. <laughs> Not much is, you know, and every yeah. time a film t- touches on Aliens, you think, oh, I wish I was watching Aliens, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, the ultimate uh, action monster. Pick. Action <laughs> horror, action, action monsters, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, the blueprint. But they're pushing uh, towards the uh, the bow, and um, this, is what, this is probably my favourite scene in the film. It's very brief. When I watch it now, I think oh, just, that's, that doesn't last very long. But when I watched this at the time in 98 or 99, I was like, holy shit. And this is this is the moment where they find the rest of the passengers. They open a door and it's just dozens and dozens of like pinkish, reddish carcasses that yeah. have been drank <laughs> by these creatures. And there's just skulls, there's like viscera all over the walls and it's yeah. just like the rest of the ship is like messy but not too not too bloody and this is this is where they've packed all of the gristle and the gore and the the blood it's like the dungeon of the ship where there's just yeah. these mutilated bodies and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean it's a very brief glimpse now when i watch it i think oh why is that my favorite bit of the film but at the time i was like whoa <laughs> fucking gore you know yeah um not even as much gore as you get in a horror film but in this film it was quite a lot of gore you know <laughs> multiple tentacles attack at this time um the combination of them being in water which obviously causes a lot of trouble a great sequence i think the film picks up again here um there's a great sequence where hanover aka sagat uh, is running away with joey and he shoots joey in the leg so that he can escape it's a sort of a sacrifice but then five minutes later joey finds him and all, all you can see is him looking up and he's on the table. And he's like, are you all right? And then it, the camera pans back to show that he's half half digested by yeah. a tentacle um, <laughs> being slowly digested. In a hilarious turn, um, Joey gives him a, a gun so that he can kill himself mm. so that he's not digested slowly. And instead of doing that, he shoots Joey. Then he goes to try and kill himself, and there's no <laughs> bullets left in the gun. That's a really good bit. I thought that was really witty, yeah, yeah, really yeah. funny. I quite like the idea of people being slowly digested by a monster. Yeah. It sounds like quite a bad death. Yeah. Rather than just being chomped. That's quite sort of torturous. <laughs> yeah. Rather than a T Rex like chomping your head off. Mm. Imagine a worm or a snake really slowly digesting you inside. Yeah. That's quite bad. That's quite horrific. Yeah. 
when you really think about it, it's a silly film, but if you stop and think about that as a method of death, it's quite uh, quite harrowing. Yeah. Uh, Finnegan and Joey are planning their escape. Canton sort of returns um, to chase Trillian. They all sort of split off on their own way. And it's around this time, in the, again, in the bow of the ship, the largest part of the ship, that you get the reveal of the full monster. And, you know, I don't know if you were expecting this, but it's a twist because you were meant to think that they were worms or something, but it's actually one massive monster. I thought that it I was that a one mint monster the whole right, way through. Right, okay. <laughs> From when I first saw it, I mean, anyway. Right. So you, you, you sort of got the impression it was one monster. Yeah, that was time, just right? like putting some of its tentacles through into the ship right yeah because i mean that's what i i think i originally thought as yeah. well but i got the sense in the film they were maybe trying to mislead you a little bit think that these were worms or, and he was like this these creatures are everywhere and yeah. stuff like that so maybe they attempted that but i didn't it didn't really do a great job <laughs> no no uh, i don't think it really came off perhaps some people who haven't maybe seen these many this many uh, monster films would think oh no it's like all little worms oh my god it's actually some sort of giant kraken uh, but this is the this is the moment that you get the full reveal of of the monster, in its um, in all its glory. What what did you think of the overall design of the monster and the and the effects themselves? Obviously, um, bearing in mind that nineteen ninety eight is the the year. Yeah. So the the CGI, I said, maybe it's dated a bit, but it was probably pretty good at the time. The monster was good, kind of generic in a way, but it was massive and slimy and yeah, pretty. I don't know. I wouldn't want to be. Sp- look face to face with that so uh, kind of like video yeah. video game mo- boss yeah yeah like you can yeah, imagine yeah. then god of war or something like that like you've got to fight this thing but you you've you got to do it bit by bit you know yeah. you've got to chop off a few tentacles and it's like some big squiddy thing that's kind of yeah. horrific i thought it was kraken pretty decent yeah yeah if you, if you watch like the clash of the titans remake with the kraken looks a bit like this you know so um yeah i think the effects in this are, are brilliant and I, the creature design i think is good even if it is, yeah, a squid or a kraken, whatever you want to call it. What I feel is a somewhat of an iconic uh, jet, jet ski sequence to end the, the film. <laughs> um, I really enjoy it. Um, like I said, after the sort of tepid middle of the film, the the, the uh, third act is just all action, bam, 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 you know. And um, this is where Finnegan and Trillian uh, find a jet ski handy by uh, by the exit. And uh, what they're going to do is leap out of the ship, but they've got to get a good run up first. So they they basically get a run up and end up going half halfway around the ship, and it's great <laughs> because like you know it's all high octane and the music is pumping, and they're going you know, zipping down a corridor and they and then oh shit some tentacles come in so they've got to make a right turn, and then oh there's something's on fire so they've got to make a left turn, <laughs> and this is all just to get a run up to to get out of the ship. It's, it's quite ridiculous, but they do manage to get a, a great a great run up. Uh, the ship explodes into bits due to some previous rigging of dynamite. I, I can't remember. The ship explodes into bits. The monster explodes into bits. Yeah, that was funny. Um, just lots of little chunks of, of squid. Pretty insane explosion. Yeah, again, not not, not too bad with the effects for the time. Um, and Finnegan and, and Trillian are able to uh, jet ski off to a nearby island. <laughs> and then uh, the next day... Joey, who they previously thought had died, sort of paddles in on a surfboard. Again, this is your comic relief, you know. Joey! <laughs> um, uh, I should mention throughout the film, I don't know if you noticed, they were trying to really get this over as a catchphrase. Finnegan's catchphrase is, Now what? Yeah. <laughs> it's all pretty bad as a catchphrase. Apparently in the script it was, What now? And they, they changed it to, Now what? Um, give it extra extra punch, I guess, you know. <laughs> and it's I love this ending as well. They're on the island, Joey, Trillian, and and Finnegan, and they're like, "Oh, thank God, we found an island. We can just wait here to get rescued." And then lots of noises start coming mm. from the jungle, and there's a there's a, a bird's eye view of something. Yeah, it's quite a long shot, but you don't see anything. No, you just see but like trees just goes, being trampled. Now what? And, it, now what? Yeah. and just lo- yeah, loads of birds flying away and things being trampled. Yeah, and you're thinking, ah, oh, when's that film coming? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> and there you go. That is Deep Rising from 1998. What were your overall thoughts on this, Mark? Um, yeah, it's pretty good. There's like pretty sort of generic plot line. There's parts in it where there's just a lot of uh, running around, shooting. But yeah, there was some funny parts in it. I think it's to liked... to its credit that it was tongue in cheek. and yeah. knew it was a bit oh, daft. Yeah. Otherwise, was... you you screwed, aren't you? There you was know? no deeper plot, and you wouldn't want there to be. No. Um, 
I liked Joey. Like you said, he was like yeah. one of the funnier characters. Yeah, and he got more daft as the film went on. <laughs> like he started off like, because there's, when they're on the small boat at the start, yeah. and they're all quite, most of them are quite macho sort of men. And yeah. They have that kind of standoff where they're like, yeah, about to shoot each other. But then Joey is just totally not like the rest of them yeah. at all. So that's quite cool. I like that. He was good comic um, relief and kept the film silly. Yeah. Even when horrific things were happening. And it was surprisingly big budget for a, you know, yeah. not a great film. No, I was quite surprised but by the okay. budget. Again, yeah. the effects. I I think to get these kind of effects in 98, you've got to have quite a bit of money. Hmm. And Rob, Rob Bottin, who had done The Thing and Robocop and Total Recall, those are huge films. Yeah. Or, you know, Robocop and Total Recall are, you know, and... He, could, he probably wasn't that cheap, and they, they got him, and they got, obviously, a good budget behind it. There was some uh, good comedy in it. There's a bit where the female character says something like, give me a chance to break the rest of your face. Not that anyone would notice <laughs> <laughs> about Joey. Yeah. That made me laugh. It's snappy. Yeah, um, yeah. And a few other, like, just silly lines. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, overall, it was pretty enjoyable. Interestingly, the, um, the island with the monster noises, that was going to be a King Kong reboot. Oh, right. That Stephen Summers was going to direct, and he, it was next up on the schedule for the studio, but it never ended up ended up happening, and um, fell into development hell for a few years until Peter Jackson uh, picked it up. So that was meant to be Skull Island, and that ah. was what, that was what was going to happen next. They were going to have to fight King Kong. <laughs> I think I would rather have seen that film than Peter Jackson's uh, King Kong, but <laughs> I suppose the, the effects came on quite a bit um, by yeah. that point, and getting wetter studios involved is always. It's always good, but yeah, I love Deep Rising. Uh, I don't really think it's a bad film, but I, uh, I wanted to review it at some point on the show here. But it's it's cheesy enough and it's daft enough to, uh, yeah, I think, to it's... make it an ish locky for sure. But I mean, the effects these are way better than the effects had any right to be in 1998. You put this next to, again, The Mummy Returns, which was like three years later, or Catwoman, which was like three years later, <laughs> which we've talked about. Yeah, that was bad. Like this is light years ahead of those, yeah. and not on a par, I think, with you know, maybe not Terminator and, and James Cameron type films, but you sort of mid tier uh, action monster films. I remember like coming across the first Harry Potter film when I was flicking through the channels like recently, and the effects were terrible. And, yeah, and that was like maybe a year after this. Yeah, film, so <laughs> I think it's just a bit of a lucky dip with CGI in these days, wasn't it? It was like I don't even know if it if it made a difference if you had loads of money because I don't think people really knew what good CGI was in a lot yeah. of time. I think sometimes massive films Terminator had two. terrible. It was you know. Yeah, decent, I thought <laughs> some massive films had great CGI, but some massive films had terrible CGI. Now was that them trying to um, cut corners and they didn't want to spend a lot of money on that, or did mm. they just not realize? what it was you know what does good cgi look like we know now because it's because it's 2020 and we know but back then it was difficult to measure it against you I could think, only measure it against certain films i think know? the matrix was pretty cool everyone liked yeah. that at the time i suppose but but i i think the effects have, have aged reasonably well for a film for a film from this era hmm. the silliness and the and the the tongue-in-cheekness i think has, has aged the film quite well as well so it's just a great sort of um cheesy b movie popcorn movie Lots of um, lots of surprising amount of like terrifying gore, um, but also some good like wise cracks and a yeah. a pretty a pretty flimsy plot. But that's Who fine. Cares? That's fine. You yeah. don't want to have to think so, yeah. too much in this film. <laughs> Deep Deep Rising is a good laugh, a good a good cheesy monster movie. I would, would recommend it. So now we move on to our second film that's set on a cruise ship, and that is Ghost Ship from two thousand and two. So we're going ahead uh, four years here. Um, the stars Gabriel Byrne, who's quite a big star. Like you said, he was in The Usual Suspects and things like that. Mm. Some quite big films of the 90s. Carl Urban, who was just getting his start. He he returns to the show after his performance in Doom, which you probably won't remember. I don't, wouldn't blame you if you didn't. <laughs> um, and a young Emily Browning, uh, is it, who was a child actor at the time in this film. So quite an infamous uh, a bad movie, bad horror movie that I had never seen before tonight, even uh, despite... People telling me that I should, like I say, some people were being serious. Some people obviously weren't. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, certainly uh, on on everyone's list of of infamous bad movies to check out, isn't it? So mm. this was actually written um, as a different film called Chimera in 1996, yeah. and took this many years to be made. Um, it was conceived by producers as The Shining on a Boat, which which sounds about right. Speaking um, of development hell, then <laughs> <laughs> more development hell. Uh, the visual effects were done by the same people that did Scooby-Doo. 
which is obvious in some scenes, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so this this film is known primarily for its opening scene. And I'd heard this time and time again, but I had successfully avoided knowing what that was. Well, I didn't know until we watched it tonight and uh, <laughs> Emma mentioned it. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've seen this opening scene referred to many times, but only as that opening scene or, oh, wow, that scene, yeah. you know, so... Uh, somehow, for the last eighteen years, I've avoided knowing what that in, in, entails yeah. uh, until now. So the uh, the film opens with quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting scene to begin with. You get a sort of a fake sort of pink logo, which makes you think it's not going to be a horror film. Although surely all the marketing was yeah, that was weird. Why horror was based, so I don't pink? I don't know why. <laughs> I don't. It was. <laughs> it can't possibly be a twist that oh, you thought this was going to be a. <laughs> like a, a light-hearted comedy and it's actually a horror film. Like, and it was like a curly font as well. Yeah, like. curly pink, like, <laughs> Thelma and Louise font. Yeah. Like, you must have marketed this as a horror film. If you didn't, then you're an idiot. Yeah. Um. So why would that Why would that be a twist, you know? Uh, you do get young young Emily Browning here as, uh, I think, Katie, uh, the young girl. There's a sort of blissful scene where... Um, there's a sort of lounge singer uh, singing, everyone's sort of dancing on the deck... It's just this sort of picturesque scene where everyone's having a great time on this cruise ship, having the time of their lives. Pretty similar to the one, the opening, the early scene in Deep Rising. Yeah, yeah. kinda. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everything's fine until, um, and here we have this this infamous scene. So as they're dancing, you see this machinery sort of winding up, these cables being wound around a sort of cog, and then all of a sudden you see this wire sort of fly through this this crowd of dancing people and then tighten at the other side just with blood dripping on it so i i think i've seen enough films to know what this means i think by this point um you know what's going to come next and then very slowly and to their credit it's very slow people sort of just droop a little um some people's clothes sort of fall off (laughs) below us below the waist or below the, the below the sternum um, little little rivulets of blood start dripping from parts, and you're like, "Yeah, come on, come yeah. on, we know we know what's going to happen." And then, yeah, obviously they've all been bisected. Bisected <laughs> is is the word I wrote several times. <laughs> bisected by cheese wire is what's happened here. I was thinking garroted, um, and I was like, "No, bi- bisected is better." <laughs> bisected by cheese wire is the name of my death metal album, <laughs> and I think it's great because they're all bisected at slightly different parts of their bodies which they would because they'd all be different heights so some of them are through the chest some have been completely cleaved in half and their guts are hanging out yeah um one guy's been got through the sort of mouth so he's got like a chelsea smile and Mm. then the top portion of his head slides off yeah (laughs) This is fucking this awesome. Is quite, oh, this is quite impressive. Like <laughs> This was actually, considering the rest of the film we'll get into wasn't scary, this was quite horrific. It was amazing. Yeah. If I didn't know what I obviously did know, I would have gotten really excited and thought, this film's going to be brilliant. I mean, but because I already knew that that wasn't going to happen. But people seeing this in 2002 must have been like, fucking hell. <laughs> What's going on? This like, is the, the best scene. horror film. This is going to be the best <laughs> horror film ever. Like, imagine... Imagine the crushing disappointment when they got to the end. <laughs> they peaked too soon with this film. What What did you think of this scene, seeing it for the first time ever? It was ever, pretty like... good. Like it was, it wasn't entirely without cheese because there were people's like faces, facial expressions were just like, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like a fish out of water. But it was yeah. pretty, um, it was pretty gory. Like it wasn't just a flash of like one or two people. It mm. went through m- many different characters who had been bisected in different areas, different of their body. stages. Yeah. And then, and then there's that bit where the woman's on the floor, and like her upper half with her arms are like trying to grab her lower <laughs> half and put her back together. Um, it gets a which, bit a bit panto, yeah, which yeah. was kind of a bit ridiculous, yeah. but it was still kind mm. of horrifying. It was still, it was yeah. still kind of like, oh, that's pretty grim in a cool way. Um, so yeah, I did actually really enjoy this scene. I thought it was really cool. Um, actually, a few a few horror movies were doing this at the time. Um, I remember it very well in Cube. Um, oh, yeah. I think Cube was from 98 or 99, whenever it was. There's the bit in that where um, lots of cheese wire. More yeah. than more than bisects, whatever the multiple version of that is. I'm sure they went on to do this in like Saw. And yeah, stuff like oh that. yeah, definitely Saw. Um, I remember The Cell, the Jennifer Lopez starring... 
Uh, horror did that with like a horse was cut into many different pieces. It's mm. a bit of a trope now, but I'm not I'm not sure if a ton of films did it before this. So this was still quite shocking and made quite a bit in, big impact. And yeah, I think this is this deserves its reputation as one of the greatest <laughs> openings in any horror film. And, yeah. and um, more the pity that obviously that it doesn't um, continue. But no. but we must continue. So. <laughs> Uh, we fast forward here um, to the present day because if you didn't realise at the beginning the, the opening scene was in 1962 so at this time that's 40 years uh, in the past much like Deep Rising we are introduced to uh, this crew of a tugboat who are sailing through choppy waters looking for a ship of some sort yeah, yeah. very similar carbon this carbon time uh, well before they were going to loot the ship whereas yeah. this time they say they're going to salvage it so it's it's pretty much really the much same thing yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, although uh, in this in this instance they they presume that the, everyone on the ship is dead where they didn't in deep rising so you have murphy your captain played by gabriel byrne and your crew uh, including carl urban who plays a guy called mundy uh, and a few other a few other people uh julianne margolis plays a character called Epps and she she's really the protagonist of of the film here. They've been offered the the job in this bar. Again, this is quite a cliched scene. A, a group a, a crew is having a drink in a bar and someone comes over saying, "Hey, do you guys want to uh, come find this thing, you know? Like didn't we see this in um what was that crocodile film we reviewed Blood Surf? Oh yeah. <laughs> like people are having a drink in a bar and someone says, "Hey, I'll give you money if you take me to this thing." Yeah. It happens in Every boat-based yeah. horror film. Do you want to go on this adventure that's we're yeah. probably going to die in? And then the crew will always say, like, oh, I don't know, it's going to cost you this much. And the guy will be like, no, no way. And they'll be like, can't help you then. And then the guy will be like, okay, okay. And that's, <laughs> that's what happens here again. It happens all the time. Uh, so they agree to the job eventually, and this guy uh, called Ferryman um, is going to come along. He's the guy that wants to pay them to find this ship that's been missing. This is obviously the ship that we... That we saw in the opening. Off we go to the strains of Mudvayne. Yes, uh, that was very cool and unexpected. We weren't expecting that, and suddenly Mudvayne's hit "Not Falling" from uh, from O two or O one, maybe. There's lots of um, Colonial Marine style uh, horseplay, uh, including Carl Urban's character saying, "Navy boys take it up the ass." <laughs> yeah, quite quite um, out of context and unnecessary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why did he say that? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. Just um, good-natured joshing. It's sort of a... I, I, I hate to go back to aliens every time, but there's a scene where they see something on the radar and they're like... They look up and it's not there and they look at the radar and it is there and yeah. then all of a sudden the, their tugboat like crashes into the cruise ship and they're like, oh shit, there it is, you know. That was a very cliche moment that's been done a yeah. lot before. A bit Titanic-esque as well. Like, yeah. there's an iceberg there, oh, it'll be fine. Shit, you know. Didn't they mention an iceberg in this film as well? They must have mentioned some sort of Titanic, <laughs> Titanicness. Yeah. So yeah, then we get a bit, a bit of backstory here. Then about it, it, it uh, Murphy knows the whole story behind this. It was an Italian cruise ship that went missing in 1962, just vanished into thin air, uh, never to be seen again. If there's one thing this captain knows about, it's the law of the sea. Yeah. And the law of the sea says that uh, we have salvage rights on this ve- on this uh, on this ship. Um, whatever we find, we can keep because it's international waters. You know, it gets a bit boring when he starts talking about like maritime laws and yeah. international waters. Like we don't care. I don't like, know. No. Yeah. <laughs> get on, get on with it. We don't care about exposition. Just <laughs> <laughs> it's like in the Phantom Menace when they started going on about trade embargoes and stuff like that for like ten minutes. Like what the fuck is this? You know. Yeah. So of course, much like Deep Rising, the salvage uh, crew. Start exploring this completely abandoned cruise ship. I would say that the ship is in considerably worse condition than the one in Deep Rising, having been abandoned for 40 years. Hmm. Uh, what I did quite like about this film, other than the opening scene, is the the set design I thought was quite good. Yeah, I thought it was um, really good, actually. Quite atmospheric, kind of like Bioshock vibes in yeah. a lot of it, like really well lit and stuff had been made to look like it had, it had been rusting and barnacled. You know, having been floating around the ocean for 40 years, you would expect that sort of look. Yeah, I thought they'd put a lot of effort into that. Um, yeah. yeah, it had that very kind of... Most of the budget, I think, yeah. since there weren't really any effects. Uh, there was no big monster to 
digitize. Uh, I think they put a lot of money into the um, into the sets here. Yeah. Murphy visits the captain's cabin, so they they all sort of branch off on their own sort of side quests, if you like, to to do to investigate things that somehow relate to them. Hmm. So the captain's visiting the captain's cabin, and and this Epps is sort of going after this little girl because she's got some sort of um, issues with having children or wants children, something like that. Through all of this, the song from the beginning of the film starts playing through the radio, which I thought was quite a cool idea. Um, that this this song that the the singer was singing at the beginning of the film is sort of still echoing yeah. in the, in the ship, and it starts coming through their walkie talkies and things like that. That's quite cool. Um, they open a door and loads of water and like corpses come flying out of it, which is quite cool. Waterlogged forty-year-old corpses looking quite well. They've been in seawater, I guess. And they find a trunk of gold in the ship. So this sort of this is the jackpot as far as a salvage ship is concerned. Very strange subplot around this time where this guy, the first mate of the ship, Greer, um, he starts hearing sexy ghost voices calling yeah. out to him. This is <clears throat> one of my favourite subplots. <laughs> <laughs> so while everyone else is wandering around like finding dead bodies, he's just hearing some sexy... Italian um, like lounge singer uh, voice uh, beckoning him around. Yeah, it's not a great subplot to be to be given, I don't think. But then once they're loading the gold onto the uh, onto the tugboat, you see a ghost. Well, you don't see anything. You just see the gas valve unscrewing itself. So presumably a ghost causing a gas leak. They hit the ignition and then the boat explodes, much like the boat in Deep Rising exploded as well. Mm. So they're stuck on the ghost ship, the cruise ship, which obviously is a problem. They start fighting amongst themselves. It very quickly sort of um, breaks down into a fight. Like, just one point, Carl Urban says to uh, to Greer, like, oh, why don't you grow up? And he just turns around and, like, lamps him in the face. It's like, whoa! <laughs> it's just like this idea, like in The Shining, that, uh, you know, they're trapped inside this place and that, that, that it's the people that start to go mad. Yeah. Not the, It's the people you got to look out for, not, not the ghosts. They're you know? getting at each other. Mm. Yeah. It's quite a fun scene here where um, Carl Urban and another character... They break into some forty-year-old food supplies. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> <That's> ridiculous! This scene. <laughs> and I think Carl Urban would be very proud of this this performance. <laughs> they open a massive tin of beans, and he sort of eats them, and just makes these very odd faces when he's eating them, like, Ugh. like he's like, oh, this is really good, and the the other guy's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, try these beans, they're great. Oh, oh, they are great. Try this as well. Oh, that's really good as well. That's oh, surprising since they're forty-year-old tinned goods. It's like, yeah, it's great, isn't it? And then in a, in a scene directly cribbed from the Lost Boys, worms. You've been eating worms, <laughs> Carl Urban, uh, or maggots in this case. And they realise they've been eating maggots. And again, more more like ridiculously over the top facial acting from Carl yeah. Urban, <laughs> <laughs> pushing you know, them out with his tongue. Around. Yeah, like g- gurning the maggots out of his mouth. Yeah, um, all very unnecessary. And then we get more of the subplot with Greer here, which is uh, this is some quite good effects. He's in the abandoned, like, decrepit dining room, and it all sort of rematerializes around him while he's standing in the middle of the ballroom. Like all of the tables, yeah. sort of put themselves back together, and the lights come back together, and the guests sort of reappear. I thought that this was quite some some good effects. Mm. And this is when the the lounge singer character uh, herself appears. This is the woman that's been trying to seduce him uh, from beyond the grave. He dances with her. At the same time, uh, Epps is again meeting with the the dead girl, um, Katie, who it turns out hung herself after uh, after everyone died on the ship. Uh, Greer follows the lounge singer. This is hilarious. She takes off her dress. <laughs> Um, so she's only wearing her um, really long, um, sexy gloves, <laughs> uh, and she's just strutting around um, naked. And he's he's following her. He's taking off his. He's like, his, he's his, like where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> he's just like leching after her, like, oh yeah, where are you going? <laughs> taking off his jacket, he's like, oh, I'm gonna get gonna get laid with a ghost. This is gonna be great. And then um, she stops. He reaches out to grab her tits <laughs> and his hand goes through them and he just falls down like an elevator shaft and impales himself. It's, how could this have been taken seriously? This is ridiculous. That was amazing. 
It was the fun, one of the funniest parts of the film. Also, uh, she's wearing a red dress, and the woman in Deep Rising was wearing mm. a red dress as well. So similar, a similar an, dress. Another similarity mm. to the other film. Yeah, we don't know if she had ghost titties there. No, no. <laughs> it was never revealed. So there you go. <laughs> never try to grab ghost titties because <laughs> you'll just fall, you'll fall down you'll, an elevator shaft. You'll fall on your face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, you're getting or, paid. Or worse. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it gets real messy here. I wasn't quite sure what was going on. A flashback here shows like more stuff that happened on the ship. So apparently it wasn't just people being bisected by cables, but there was also like some poison going into all the food. Yeah. So I guess that because not everyone was dancing and being decapitated, all the other people were either poisoned by the food. There was rat poison going in the food, but it also shows people grabbing guns from somewhere and killing each other, people going mad. So people um, like trying to take over the ship. They yeah. were going for the gold, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. you see them picking up the gold, which apparently they had salvaged from another ship. It's all like a circle. Um, the feel here is that the, the actual sole survivor of the ship was the ferryman character, Ferry man, get it? Yeah. Um, who who initially had contracted them to go out and find the ship. So he is a ghost, I guess, or a demon. He seems to be collecting He's like ghosts. The collector souls. of souls. Yeah. It goes very silly here. There are never any effects to make him into anything supernatural. He's just a bloke. He's just a white dude that was alive in 1962 and also now. Not very scary. Epps is really the the. You know, the the protagonist here, the, the last surviving character. Murphy has been drowned. Uh, Munda, Carl Urban. There's quite a nice scene where he's um, scuba diving uh, to try and repair something, and he's minced up by some gears. Oh, yeah. That, the, was, uh, that was good. It's quite gory, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was a real nonsense monologue. This is where the film like just descends into nonsense. Yeah, I, I kind of switched off. The um, ferryman, <laughs> the collector of souls, goes on this awful monologue about well, you salvage ships, I salvage souls. Yeah. I'm going to have to go back to my upper management and, and explain something to them. What the fuck are you on about? <laughs> and again, it, this would have this actually would have been less cheesy if he'd turned into some sort of demon. Yeah. Some, somehow. This is just some really boring like accountant-looking guy <laughs> talking about he needs to meet with management. He wasn't and, a threatening-looking guy, was no, he? No, <laughs> he needs to balance the books, and it's all about... Um, Collection and payment and all. If he'd have, if he'd have actually had some kind of demonic powers, where he was like brutally murdering people, it would have been a bit better. But. It would have somehow been better. Like it would have yeah. been less cheesy somehow. But he's just this boring guy talking about he needs to balance the books and payments and debits and things like that. It's like he's trying yeah. to bore me to death or something. But she uh, she's rigged up some dynamite. She shoots a harpoon which explodes everything. Massive explosion of the ship, like at the end of Deep Rising. This is quite a, it's quite a funny scene. I think the effects are actually quite good, but it's so preposterous that that, it, that you can't help but laugh. <laughs> the ship is slowly sinking, and and the the ghosts are swimming up through the water away oh, from. Oh god, <laughs> that was so cheesy. <laughs> so like the ship was their purgatory, and now the ship has been destroyed. They can all um, go to the next life, so they're all swimming up. Um, along with with Epps, who is also having she's having to swim up through the the lost souls of the ship and 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 then there's I think it's a shame because it's quite a good shot where the ship is like the bow is sticking out and on on these ghosts are like floating around it visually it's quite quite good but it's just really silly the start of the film you had people getting bisected <laughs> with like wire <laughs> and brutally killed and at the end you've got this really cheap fantasy kind of it's quite disney ish yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all the all the ghosts turn into like fireflies and, and go up into the sky and you're like what happened here how like, disappointing yeah they're all released from purgatory uh, epps is rescued by another ship and then as she being loaded in the ambulance she, for some reason, sees all of the characters from the film again, loading the gold into another um, ship. Yeah. I don't really know what that's well, meant yeah, to me. Yeah, I don't get that. I know, I don't understand. But you get a bit more mud vein, so yeah. it's all good. <laughs> Roll the credits and carry on with the, with the mud vein. So there it is, infamous ghost ship from 2002. What were your overall thoughts on um, this? Yeah, it was quite quite entertaining in parts. The, the, the opening scene was... 
probably the peak of the film. Uh, <laughs> That's the, never a good thing, is it, really? No. The, the first two and a half minutes. <laughs> the, bis- the bisecting was great. Um, some of the deaths were quite cool, yeah. I suppose. I was kind of interested in like the history of the ship, but then when it went on to this soul-collecting stuff, I was just like, oh, I'm not interested in that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I thought the sets, like you said, the sets looked pretty good. Some of the characters were enjoyable more often in an ironic way with the woman uh, like you said like the uh, guy who uh, went after that woman's tits and uh, <laughs> got, got his like comeuppance yeah. yeah I quite enjoyed it I laughed uh, various various parts um, it was quite entertaining I kind of lost the plot towards the end but so did the film who cares yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah I think it's a shame I think there was potential here I don't really know what happened it seems like there was too many too many cooks, really. Um, the script originally, in there from 1996, the Chimera script, was really a, more of a thriller. There were no ghosts in it. There were no collectors of souls, no demons. It was just about a salvage ship that found an, a, a sort of an abandoned ship and then found some gold and then turned on each other. It would turn out that Murphy, the captain, was killing people all along and it was sort of driven by the greed of the gold and stuff like that, which... Yeah. Does, also doesn't sound like a really exciting film, but nah. I mean, apparently everyone, all the actors signed on based on the original script that they'd read, the the, thr- the thriller, and um, by the time they turned up to do the film, Joel Silver, one of the producers, had altered the script from thriller to this cheesy horror film that we saw, and, but um, according to them it was too late to do anything about it. I was like, well... Surely you've got some recourse if you've if the script is completely different yeah. to the one you signed up to. I don't know if you can't do anything about it. Julianne Margulies uh, disowned the film. She was outraged that they'd changed it. She didn't want to do it, but she was contractually obligated. All this sort of stuff. Not not the film they signed up to by all accounts. No. But I'm not I'm not sure about that. I like I said I don't think it would have been better if it was a straightforward thriller with just an abandoned ship because an abandoned ship is spooky and there would have to be some horror there. Uh, yeah, why don't we do The Shining, but at sea? Which isn't a bad idea either. That's quite a good idea. Someone p- could probably make that film quite good, but it wasn't this film and there was too many plot holes. Um, nothing that scary happened, I wouldn't say. It was mostly just jump scares. Like, yeah, uh, it was... suddenly there would be that character that was hung. Would yeah, just come a corpse. Out of nowhere. Yeah. yeah, a surprise corpse. Or the, yeah. what's behind this door? Loads of water. Yeah. Um, you oh, know. there's blood seeping through some bullet holes. I think maybe... That was actually if, kind of cool. But. <laughs> I think if you'd have sort of... I think they got carried away with how far from the original they went. So I think if you'd pitched it somewhere between a, a, a thriller and the supernatural thing, hmm. it maybe could have worked. Like, just, just an atmospheric setting, you know, they maybe there are some ghosts or maybe there's just some things stalking you, you know. Um so go full full on and show the ghosts and like have this woman that got naked to lure this guy to his death. It was all and it was all the stuff where they go to touch the ghosts and their hands go through them. It's like it's tough to do ghost effects and make them not cheesy, really. Yeah. There you go. I don't think this film is really as bad as as uh, as it's made out to be. I think people were just so um Misled by the opening scene and and perhaps by the the marketing, which made it out to be to be a better film than it was. But I think it turns out as sort of an average film with some cool bits in it, hmm. some really cool gore in in parts and a really cool opening scene. But yeah, just unravels as as we go on. So yeah, that's Ghost Ship from two thousand and two. So Mark, if you had to, if you had to salvage one of these ships and bring them back to your <laughs> luxury desert island and have it sorted out and and uh, and keep it forever or if you had to uh, um, blow up one of these ships and see it sink to the bottom of the sea which would you salvage which would you sink oh that's quite a tough one actually i think i know what you're going to say but the deep rising like i thought it got better as it went on as this on ghost ship started out with a big cool scene and mm. then sort of you want an incline rather than a decline yeah, surely yeah <laughs> um I laughed at both of them. I think I just preferred the characters in Deep Rising. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I liked Joey. I would probably salvage Deep Rising. Yeah. And I would probably... Sink, go sink, ship. Yeah, go yeah. ship and go to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> Get in the sea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I just say I it was a bit too shallow, that one. 
<laughs> yeah, I agree. Deep Rising is is good fun, and it, it acknowledges um, enough of its cheesiness. Ghost Ship doesn't do any of that. It um, tries to be a bit more serious, and um, yeah, like we were saying, the end scene where everyone floats up. I think they thought they were being really fucking um, highfalutin there. You know, like uh, we're we're saying something about yeah. spirituality and. Uh, all this and it looked ridiculous and I, I think, schmaltzy I think that's what swayed it for me is that Deep Rising was kind of more self-aware that it was like yeah. cheesy horror Much whereas more. Ghost Ship tried to do something that it didn't need to really do and, yeah. yeah but I think Ghost Ship if Ghost Ship had been super scary and had those moments of atmosphere and and um, genuine scares then could have been a genuinely good horror it, it could, film well yeah I mean it's easier said than done of course but <laughs> yeah. um, because Deep Rising shoots for a slightly lower bar uh, just being a fun monster movie with some with some good effects obviously it's, yeah. it, it achieves that much easier and yeah I've always really liked Deep Rising the idea of a, a sea monster you know is quite cool a kaiju at yeah. sea you know a kraken those things are always really fascinating whereas an abandoned ghost ship, uh, you know, that's also quite interesting. I think, you know, the idea of finding one of those and exploring it is is also quite eerie and quite spooky. But it's what you do. It's what you do with that concept and what you uh, end up filling that ship with. And they filled it with a lot of nonsense yeah. in the end. So, yeah, I agree. Deep Rising is the, the better bad movie here. It's a, it's a lot more fun, I think, certainly. So, recommendations for these films. I think we've probably mentioned most of them aliens would be your first and foremost <laughs> if you haven't um, seen that film what are you yeah, doing <laughs> what are you doing it's the best sort of blend of action and, and horror and sci-fi no one else has, has has really done it like that everyone has tried literally everyone has tried to mm. recreate that that dynamic of tough guy action heroes even with the alien sequels after aliens <laughs> yeah yeah ridley scott's tried to recreate it and failed <laughs> even predator wasn't predator was close but it wasn't still wasn't quite up to that standard so yeah. aliens is the um the benchmark for for uh squad based um that's the gold standard action of horror. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah sci-fi action horror yeah and it's interesting that you know by this time in in 1998 james cameron had moved on to doing titanic like the biggest movie ever you know mm. he'd, he'd obviously he'd nailed sci-fi action horror he didn't do it again, mm -hmm. really, or the abyss, maybe, and like Terminator Two. But he'd moved on here to like massive films, yeah. and it's it's funny that the, the, the these films were trying to ape Aliens in a way, but also Titanic in a way. Yeah, I, mean, I don't really want to recommend Titanic off off the back of these movies because that's dreadful. <laughs> um, if if only there was monsters, uh, um, you know, apart from Celine Dion um, <laughs> on the Titanic, it would have been much more entertaining. But yeah, Aliens, big cruise ship horror films are a bit more rare. You can think of lots of like Jaws, Jaws alikes, which yeah. these films are in a way, Deep Rising more so. Um, Jaws, Piranha, Alligator, any sort of initially POV thing stalking someone mm. in and around water obviously goes by that. So yeah, perhaps I would recommend Aliens, Alligator we reviewed on the show before. That's really good. Um, Jaws. So if you've not seen Jaws or Aliens, you really need to, <laughs> yeah. to sort yourself out. Aliens um, is, well, Alien was, the first Alien was, the tagline was like Jaws in space. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah, these things all, all come all come full circle. They all relate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, um, <clears throat> that has been today's show. If you've got any uh, thoughts on either of these films, do let us know. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and you can just drop us a comment or a question, and we'll respond to you, or we'll uh, we'll respond to you on on future shows. Uh, we do record these shows when we can, every now and then. Obviously, lockdown has interfered like like hell this year, mm. and uh, who knows, we might be locked down again. So, we'll uh, we'll try and uh, do another episode this year, or maybe a Christmas one, but we'll yeah. we'll have to see. Um, go over and make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel because all these shows get put on there as well. I am currently working on another version of my franchise flashbacks show, Ooh. which is a short show where I cover an entire franchise. The only one I've done so far is Tremors. Um, but I've been working my way through the Anaconda films lately. Ah, cool. So there's five of those, including Anaconda versus Lake Placid. Mm. I've been working my way through those. They they, they massively vary in, in, in quality. From, uh, from Jennifer Lopez and Ice Cube to David Hasselhoff, 
they're all there. So I'll be I'll be posting a review of that franchise shortly. Sweet. Um, and there's a few uh, a few films coming out, including the new Tremors film, which is coming out very soon, which I plan to to review as well because I love those films as well. So go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel to check out all that content, and subscribe to the podcast. Obviously, you'll be notified every time we do a new episode. Uh, give us a rating on iTunes, five stars if you wouldn't mind. But yeah, that has been our Halloween episode for 2020 where we have covered some terrifying events on cruise ships <laughs> that has been another episode of schlock tactics wishing you a happy halloween my name has been ash and i've been joined by mark thanks for listening and we'll see you next time bye, bye.